Imagine you're an art detective, and your task is to explore the mysteries behind the world's most famous paintings. I'm talking about works from Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Picasso. So grab your magnifying glass as this journey is about to begin. First off on your list is Rome. After enjoying delicious pasta, you head to the Sistine Chapel, home to the world's most famous ceiling. Oh, and you know how they say Michelangelo painted the frescoes lying down? This is just a myth. Actually, the painter created a complex system of platforms that allowed him to paint standing. You're checking out the creation of Adam, that fresco in the middle. The Italian artist Michelangelo, the author of this masterpiece, was widely known for his study of human anatomy. Art experts argue that the right part of the painting is an anatomically correct depiction of an enlarged brain. To proof check this, you try overlapping a picture of the organ and the artwork. It seems to be a match. The cerebellum, the optic nerve, and the pituitary gland are all there. Even the floating green scarf thingy appears to match the vertebral artery. Some researchers think it was Michelangelo's way of depicting knowledge and wisdom. But you have to sleep on it to decide what you think. Moving on, you catch a train and arrive in Florence. Time for a quick gelato break, then straight to the Academia Gallery. One of art's most celebrated sculptures is waiting for you inside. Michelangelo's David. David is a 17-foot tall marble wonder. It was carved for about three years. The mystery surrounding it is to figure out the statue's true expression. Looking at him from below, you'll think his face is serene and peaceful. But art historians argue that this work was largely misunderstood. Apparently, his body hides a very different story. Take a closer look, and you'll notice his brows are frowning, and the veins in his arms are popping out. That doesn't look too relaxed, does it? Michelangelo's idea was to depict David right before an important confrontation. So maybe he wasn't all that serene after all. Italy is so rich in art, you can't leave just yet. You're still in Florence. You pay a visit to the famous Uffizi Gallery. Many famous paintings are hosted by this museum, but you're checking out Botticelli's Primavera, or Spring. This artwork is mysterious from the get-go. Experts can't say the exact year it was commissioned. It remained untitled for years, until the painter Giorgio Vasari finally came up with a name for it. Usually, when critics and viewers admire this painting, they focus on the figures in the foreground. But in this case, the actual work lies in that Botticelli painted over 46 different plant species with almost identical precision. And, oh, in the painting overall, these plant figures are repeated over 200 times. Unbelievable! I'd say the last visits were full of impressions, weren't they? Ready to keep going? A plane ride later, you arrive in Paris, the city of lights, berets, and the famous Mona Lisa. You go through the Museum de Louvre and come to Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, La Gioconda. There are many theories regarding this work of art, and you dive into some of them. A strong case has been made that the Mona Lisa could be a self-portrait of da Vinci himself. Historians have thoroughly compared da Vinci's face and that of the Mona Lisa. And guess what? They appear to be strikingly similar. Oh, and then there's the smirk theory. Dentist and art expert Joseph Bartowski claims to have discovered the secret behind Mona Lisa's smirk. He says her tight facial expression is a typical indication of someone who lost their front teeth. Could it be so? Also, in 2010, the Italian Committee for Cultural Heritage found a collection of symbols hidden in the painting. These are only visible through highly technological magnifying lenses, but they showed that Leonardo inscribed an LV inside Mona Lisa's right eye. Experts guess that this is da Vinci's signature, but the other symbols, a CE in the left eye and a 72 in the arch of the background bridge are still very mysterious. Phew, you covered a lot of ground on this one. Ah, of course, at the end of your visit, remember to test if her eyes really follow you around. Now you're headed to Amsterdam to check out the Rijksmuseum. You came to see a specific Rembrandt painting that hides a mysterious story. 
The Night Watch is one of Rembrandt's most famous paintings, but experts argue that the name of the painting and its content are mismatched. Let's take a closer look. The painting depicts a large group ready to embark on a mission. Rembrandt's technique is called chiaroscuro, highlighting the contrast between light and shade. Until 1947, art critics believed the painter was depicting a nighttime scene. But when the painting was cleared of a thick dust layer, it became clear that the scene was happening in broad daylight, with the sun streaming down from the top left. Now, it's too late to change its name to The Day Watch. While in Amsterdam, you find a museum dedicated to Van Gogh's art. Did you know that he painted over 900 paintings during an impressive period of only 10 years? Anyway, the Van Gogh Museum hosts the biggest collection of yellow sunflower paintings you'll probably see in your life. Actually, almost all of Van Gogh's paintings feature dominant yellow shades. This particularity of his art may be a result of how he saw the world. Some art experts have speculated that one of Van Gogh's remedies changed his color perception, making him see more yellow around him. Okay, so this trip just keeps getting better. The next stop on your list is the United Kingdom. Then, on to the National Gallery. You may spend hours looking at Jan van Eyck's painting Arnolfini Portrait and not see anything out of the ordinary. In the foreground, a couple holds hands and stares at the viewer. But if you zoom in on the mirror on the wall, you'll see two more people in the room. Art experts say the male figure in the painting has his hands raised to greet these two people seen in the mirror and that one of the figures is von Eyck himself. Oh, and that's not the only watermark the painter left. Above the mirror, you'll see his flamboyant signature. Jan von Eyck was here, 1434. And speaking of people trying to sneak into their art, Caravaggio, the renowned Italian Renaissance painter, left a little Easter egg in one of his famous paintings, Bacchus. This one is a bit difficult to spot. In the half-filled jar in the bottom left corner of the painting, there is a tiny self-portrait of the painter himself, hidden amongst the liquid. To see the image clearly, one needs the help of sophisticated technology, or at least a very efficient magnifying lens. But it's there, a male figure, aka Caravaggio, with a brush in his hand. Fun fact, the tiny self-portrait was first noticed in 1922, over 300 years after the painting was completed. It was forgotten due to poor conservation. To finish the trip, you fly overseas across the Atlantic, all the way to Chicago. The enormous collection of the Art Institute hosts a well-known painting by Pablo Picasso, The Old Guitarist. This painting's secret is so well hidden that it also needs the help of X-ray machines and super fancy technology. But the results are worth it. The readings show that Picasso painted The Old Guitarist on top of another unfinished painting we can clearly see the outlines and shapes of a half-drawn female figure that Picasso gave up on mid-work. The emerging artists of the time used that way of saving money quite often, as canvases were expensive. This was quite a tiring world trip, wasn't it? Get some rest, Sherlock of Art. On a rainy evening, Adele returned home after a month-long vacation abroad. She lived alone, and her mother had been watching her cats. The girl walked into the house, turned on the lights, and looked around. After that, she oh, immediately no. called the police. Why? Look, there are wet footprints in the corridor. They're wet, so it means they're still fresh, and they don't belong to Adele because she just walked in. There's someone in her house. Keep your brain working, because here's another one. Mrs. Carpenter has three daughters, Ava, Jane, and Mia. Ava is now twice as old as Jane will be when Mia turns as old as Ava is now. Who is the oldest daughter, and who is the youngest? Let's rephrase it. Sometime in the future, Mia will be as old as Ava is now, and Jane will be half that age. So, obviously, Ava is the oldest and Jane is the youngest.
Mrs. Brown is a landlady of an apartment building with a no-pet policy. Not even fish are allowed. One night, she heard a cat meowing. The sound was coming from the floor above. The next day, she inspected two apartments. In which apartment does the cat live? Look, there's a cat's house in the corner of this apartment. The cat must live there. Esme was having a walk in the forest and got lost. After wandering around for a while, she found a witch's house and asked her to take her home. The witch was busy with potions, but she agreed to help Esme if the girl helped her first. There were four ingredients which needed for the potion. A few bugs, a secret herb, some magic powder, and dried mushrooms. The witch didn't remember in what order she needed to add the ingredients, but she remembered this. What's the correct order? There are four ingredients. If the powder is added before at least two of them, it means that it's added either the first or second. But since mushrooms should go before the powder, then they're added first, followed by the magic powder. Then there should be the bugs. And the secret herb comes last. Now, I have a very special mission for you. There's a robber who steals famous paintings from galleries across the globe. The police all over the world have been looking for the paintings, which the robber hides in different places. The police have managed to find the first secret place. Each painting is stored in a chest with its replica generated by AI. You can only take out one painting, and after you take it out, the chest will blow up together with the remaining painting. So, you have to choose carefully and recognize the original work of art at first glance. Here's the first chest. It stores The Scream by Edvard Munch, and it's a replica. Which one is the original? This is the original. Now it's The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. Can you recognize the original? It's this one. Did you get it right? In the next chest, you'll find the famous Mona Lisa painted by Leonardo da Vinci. You will probably recognize this one easily but the replica is very realistic, so keep your eyes wide open. Yes, this is the one and only Mona Lisa. It goes back to the Louvre now. In the fourth chest, there's another famous artwork by Vincent van Gogh, Cafe Terrace at Night. Can you spot the original one? Here's the original. Have you saved the correct one? And now it's time for the last painting in the discovered batch. It's The Old Fisherman, a painting by a Hungarian artist. Which painting should we save? This is the one. Congratulations Yahoo! and thank you for your help. We'll let you know if other paintings are found. A detective went on vacation to Spain, but at night, someone broke into his neighbor's hotel room and stole all her valuables. In the morning, the detective analyzed the camera footage and came up with three suspects. They all agreed to answer some questions. Jack said, I arrived late in the evening and I was sleeping the whole night. Allison said, I went out at night. I came to my room only a couple of hours ago. Robert said, I don't know this woman. I didn't rob her. Who should the detective arrest? Arrest Jack. He said he arrived late in the evening. But then, when did he get sunburned? There's no sun in the evening. He must have spent more time in the hotel than he claimed. 
Eliza went for a walk in a dark forest, and she found an old mansion. Of course, she went there to see what was inside. As soon as she entered, the door behind her back got locked. It was a magic house. There were three exits, but each of them seemed dangerous. Behind the first door, there was a laser with a motion sensor. Behind the second door, the floor was made of lava that burned anything that touched it. Behind the third door, there was a huge herbivore dinosaur. Which way should Eliza choose to get out safely? Eliza should pick the last entrance. Firstly, dinos are extinct. But even if there actually was one, a herbivore dino would only eat plants. It wouldn't be interested in a human. Hannah was chilling at home, drinking tea and reading, when she heard a knock on the door. She opened the door, and there was a stranger there. Oh, sorry, I must have confused the floors. I've just moved in. Sorry for disturbing you. When the guy left, Hannah called the police because she didn't believe it was just a mistake. Why was he so suspicious? The problem was that the guy knocked. If he had really thought it was his apartment, he'd have tried to open the door with his keys. Good news, police have discovered another batch of stolen paintings. Just like the previous one, they are stored in chests. Each has a replica, and only one can be saved. Are you ready to save some art? Here's the first one, American Gothic, painted by Grant Wood. Where is the original one? Here it is. Did you recognize it? Okay, the second chest. And that's Girl with a Pearl Earring by Johannes Vermeer. Can you spot the original girl? Here she is. We all know the next one, The Persistence of Memory by Salvador Dali. It was stolen from the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and we have to return it. But which one? This is a replica, and this is the original. Did you save the right one? Just two more left, so stay alert. In the fourth chest, we have The Kiss by Gustav Klimt. As always, you should decide which of the two is the original. So, what's your call? Of course, this is the one. And it's time to save the last painting, The Mysterious Black Square by Kazimir Malevich. Can you find the original one? It wasn't easy, but this is the one you need. Thank you for your help. Woohoo! The paintings all go back to where they were stolen from. Nikki participated in a game show, and she won. She won three exclusive gifts, a Montclair jacket, a Vivienne Westwood purse, and a Ferrari. But here's a catch. She is to pick her presents herself by choosing between the original and a replica. Will you help her pick the correct prize? Here are two Montclair jackets. One of them is the original, and the other is a replica. Which one should Nikki choose? This one. It has the correct logo, so it must be the original. Next, two identical purses, but only one of them is the original one from Vivian Westwood. Which one? This one with the correct logo. And finally, a Ferrari. Let's see if you remember their logo. Yes, this is the one. Great job.
It's one of the most important national monuments of the United States, with over a half a million visitors each year. The Washington Monument was constructed to commemorate George Washington, the first American president. But if you've ever looked at it closely, in person, or by googling its pictures, you've surely noticed it has two different colors. Well, it's not a design choice, if that's what you're wondering. The Washington National Monument Society, the authority in charge of the construction, ran out of funding, and the project was put on hold in the 1850s. It took another 25 years for the authorities to resume the construction. They finished the upper two-thirds of the monument in 1884. Since they evidently used marble from a different location, given the time that had passed, it was difficult to envision how these materials would behave in the future. These two sections look very much alike at first, but with time, mostly due to winds, rain, and erosion, they ended up having different hues. There's even a third portion of marble, which is noticeable only if you pay very close attention. The constructors initially went for a marble provider in Massachusetts, but quickly realized the colors didn't match. They had to switch to another supplier, but their mistake resulted in this third shade of marble. It's only noticeable up front, so people mostly think that the monument has two colors. The builders figured out the difference quite fast and found a type of marble that resembled the initial one. But the new material eventually turned to a different color too, mostly to weather conditions. Are you one of those people who like to spend their free time on Pinterest or Instagram in search of your next travel location? Then you surely haven't missed a little Italian town called Cinque Terre. The reason why it's so popular among photographers and globetrotters is its brightly painted buildings, which come in a nice contrast to the crystal clear ocean waters. These houses come in a huge selection of colors, from green to yellow and even bright pink. So it's no wonder this location is such a hit. It looks more like a painting than an actual place on Earth. But why are these houses so gorgeously bright? Local legends say that fishers used to paint their homes in various colors so that they could quickly spot them from the water as they came back home from the sea. Now, some other buildings come with coloring so specific that their inhabitants are prohibited from changing it by law. It's the case of the Pink City, otherwise known as Jaipur in India. It has numerous buildings of different hues of pink, from dusty rose to fuchsias. This impressive coloring dates back to the 1800s. Rumor has it that the Indian Maharaja of the time, Sawai Ram Singh, wanted to welcome Prince Albert during his visit. So he literally painted the whole town pink. Which of course begs the question, why he chose pink and not any other color? And it turns out this hue was meant to subtly imply the idea of a welcoming location or a place of hospitality. Jaipur isn't the only monochrome city in the world. Its blue counterpart is located in Morocco. It's called Chefchaoui. Some locals say that the city is painted blue to symbolize the beautiful coloring of the Mediterranean Sea. Others consider that painting their houses blue keeps them cooler when it's hot. There are even claims that painting a house blue can help keep mosquitoes away. People believe that the hue resembles the waves of the sea, which isn't a really desirable location for insects, if you think about it. Now, this construction has become the undeniable symbol of the city of love. Ah, the Tour Eiffel. I can smell a freshly baked baguette, can't you? Well, it turns out the Eiffel Tower has a little chromatic secret of its own. This famous French monument is painted chestnut brown these days, but it hasn't always been this color. The engineer who built the tower and also gave it its name was a man called Gustave Eiffel. He claimed that the initial paint used for the tower, a very bright red, was supposed to help protect the construction from rust kind of like the Golden Gate Bridge does in San Francisco. But since it was built, the Eiffel Tower has had many different hues, like ochre, yellow, and several shades of brown. At one point, they even used the ombre paint effect. It made the tower look as if it was fading upon reaching the sky. I've hardly ever heard a more touching story than that of the Taiwanese rainbow grandpa. 
His name is Huang Yong Fu, and his story begins in the late 2000s. Given he was officially the last resident, the local authorities were just about to bring down his small village in order to make room for a modern apartment complex. To cope with his sadness, the man started painting the walls of the houses in his village. He began with drawings of birds, cats, and eventually people. In 2010, a local university student found out about this little DIY project, and the rest was history. With the help of a fundraising campaign, this little village now attracts a staggering number of tourists each year, over a million. It's no wonder the local authorities eventually renounced their plans. While we're on the subject of beautiful designs, there's a library out there that actually looks like a giant bookshelf. No, it's not a scene from a fantasy movie. Somebody actually built that. One of the facades of the Kansas City Public Library looks like an ordinary row of books lined up on a shelf. Well, not really ordinary, since the books are 25 feet tall and 9 feet wide each. You don't need to be a book nerd to want to check this one out soon. The world's largest basket isn't meant for overweight cats. It's actually a building. Yep, there's a building out there that is actually shaped like a basket. You can find it in Newark, Ohio. It was initially built to serve as headquarters for the Longoburger Company, an American producer of handcrafted wood baskets. It's also renowned among professionals as one of the best-known examples of mimetic architecture. That's a type of design where buildings are constructed to mimic their function or purpose. The building covers 180,000 square feet. It cost around $30 million to build and was completed in 1997. With seven floors and a central atrium, it also has a glass ceiling which lets natural light get inside. This immense basket is also topped with two steel handles. They're equipped with heating elements that prevent them from freezing. They also protect the glass atrium situated right below from any ice that might fall on it during the winter season. Darmstadt, Germany, there's a residential building complex built in the 1990s named the Weichspirale. It has a wonderful design, as well as an interesting story to back it up. The name literally translates to forest spiral. This might refer to the plan of the building, along with the fact that its roof is green. Not simply in color, though. This swirly building has a jaw-dropping forest on its roof, with maple and lime trees. The unique construction was completed in 2000. It has 105 apartments and more than 100 windows, each of them with its particular shape and size. With 12 floors at its highest point, the building also houses a cafe and a bar. Another interesting feature? Each corner in the construction is rounded off. Now, should you ever find yourself visiting the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, try not to miss the cube houses. These unique buildings are placed above ground level on top of a pedestrian bridge close to the city center and the Rotterdam Black metro station. In the 20th century, the city of Rotterdam was damaged. That's why later, it became the focus of new, cutting-edge architecture designs. Dutch architect Piet Blom started designing functional housing, which could also leave some room for pedestrians on the ground level. He got the idea for these houses from simple elements, such as forests and trees. Each house is placed on a hexagonal pylon, a construction made of concrete and designed to look like the trunk of a tree. Each of these pylons has a staircase that leads to well-spaced living areas. Another example of a house that looks like it has just escaped from a fairy tale is the Nautilus House. You can find it near Mexico City, Mexico. With its shell-like shape, it's also one of the first representations of bio-architecture. The man behind this unique design is Javier Senosiang. He was inspired by the works of Gaudi and Frank Lloyd Wright. The very concept of bio-architecture is that buildings should be constructed based on structures found in nature. It's also supposed to remind people of their local history and traditions. The Nautilus house doesn't have a lot of storage space, according to the builders. But this structure is supposed to be earthquake-resistant and maintenance-free. Not to mention hundreds of tiny rainbow-colored stained-glass windows decorating the building. Design shapes the world around us. The chair you're sitting on while watching this was carefully thought out by a designer. The same goes with the table where your smartphone is right now. Some designs are just so ingenious, we can't help but be mesmerized by them. From simple to complex, let's have a look at some of them. Do you organize your bookshelf by genre? 
alphabetical order, or the color of book covers? I think alphabetical order gives your house a library vibe to it, even if you use these small branched shelves. Usually, authors only put their last names on the book spine to make it easier for users to locate the book. But the designer of this Ray Bradbury book had a clever idea. He noticed that the name Ray is contained by the last name Bradbury and painted the letter R, A, and Y in different colors on the spine. This way, both the first and last name of the author are highlighted. What do you say, yay or nay? And speaking of books, this George Orwell work has sold over 4 million copies. The famous 1984 story tells a tale of surveillance and the creepiness of being constantly watched by a so-called Big Brother. I'd say this cover pretty much nails the content of the book in a genius way, and it even references literature as a medium with the use of semicolons. Way to go to this designer! If you haven't been living under a rock, you've heard once or twice about Van Gogh's story. No need to retell it here. Apparently, this designer that was showcased at the gift shop of a Van Gogh immersive experience got inspired by the artist's story. I mean, look at this set of mugs! Would you give this to your beloved, so that one of you can be the ear and the other the bandage? I'm not so sure if you ask me. I think I prefer just a regular Van Gogh mug with his face on it. What do clocks make you think of? Perhaps your mind goes straight to your grandma's cuckoo clock like mine does. I'd never say Bruce Lee would be a good idea for a clock. This designer thought legs plus Bruce Lee plus elasticity equals clockwork. Just kidding. I mean, it works for certain timestamps, but not all. Definitely not all. Design can also be used as a tool for raising awareness. There are so many examples of great marketing campaigns, but I'd say this one was pretty ingenious. Take a look at it before I give you any context. Can you guess what it's raising awareness for? Do the repeating first syllables give you any hints? This was an ad to fight discrimination against people who stutter made by the Dutch Stutter Foundation in 2021. Neat, huh? In the queue for the Best Billboard Award is this piece of advertisement for BBC's adaptation of Dracula. You know what they say, vampires don't like to appear in broad daylight. So these designers used natural light in their favor. As the sun goes down and the moon shines in the sky, we begin to see a shadow forming. And you guessed it, the shade of Dracula's face appears. I mean, wow! Shopping for stationery brings out the inner child in all of us. Pens, pencils, erasers, we love them. But what about this designer's idea to turn a regular eraser into Mount Fuji? The best part is that it's interactive. If you only use the sides, your eraser will turn into this beautiful mountain in no time. I know you have to be smart to play chess, but this designer edition set makes it seem even more difficult. In 1923, designer Joseph Hartwig came up with the Bauhaus chess set. Here, no horse looks like a horse and no queen is wearing a crown. Instead, the wooden pieces were designed to showcase the directions they can move in during a game. It's not 100% accurate though, pawns can only move forward and they're represented by a rectangle. What's that supposed to mean? We're entering the age of smart stuff. Smart TVs, smart cars, and refrigerators. But this is the first time we've seen a smart business card. If you're a divorce lawyer, maybe follow this guy's idea. Prefabricate your card in such a way that you can already split it in half. Half for one spouse and half for another. And both parts still have your phone numbers on them, just to make sure you'll get one of them to be your client. In a certain gallery, there is a skate shop that is next to a steak shop. I'm unsure who thought of this solution, but it kind of works. It's a meaty skateboard. Sure, it's weird. But kudos to whoever dared to even think of this. Okay, so help me out here. Is there such a thing as a bad design? And would you say this street sign qualifies as an example? Users seem to think it's too visually polluted. Others didn't even understand what it was advocating for. It's a pro-bike sign, by the way. I have to say, I like this person's idea, but in practice, I'd say it didn't work. 
Impressionism was a period of art history where painters used soft brush strokes to depict their subjects. Looking at it from a distance, you might think it's a bit pixelated, but this eyewear brand took this idea to another level. Apparently, if you use their glasses, you'll see paintings through a whole new lens. Clever, huh? And speaking of art, I'd say it probably took the designer of this poster a while to create this one. Everything, Everywhere, and All at Once is one of those movies that makes your brain work hard to follow the plot, and the characters, and all the colors. I'd say this designer managed to bring the essence of the movie to life. What about you? Okay, so only a few things are more boring than drain pipes. Aesthetically, of course. Their design is usually simple and repetitive, except that during the 19th century, architects were probably addicted to dragons. So, they made a bunch of buildings with drain pipes like this. You'll see a lot of this if you're visiting France. And I have to say, they're awesome. Harry Potter fans, how do you feel about a night lamp in the shape of the Hogwarts crest that comes with a remote control wand? I think my favorite part is the wand. I always wanted one of those. Way to go to whoever came up with this ingenious idea. A knife holder that looks like a white shark ready to attack its prey. Yep, this exists, and it's pretty clever. I mean, the knives coordinate perfectly to look like a shark's open jaw. Plus, the design is cute. It's a yay for me. If you've loved the Red Hot Chili Peppers before, you'll love them even more now. Their logo is a famous red star, as you may know. And apparently, for their concert in Perth, Australia, the ticket included transportation to and from the concert venue. So the designer used the red star symbol as roads to advertise this piece of information. One of those lovely cases where art and music meet real life and rock it. One of the basic rules of marketing is, you gotta know your public. I'm guessing this mattress ad wouldn't work just about anywhere in the world, but boy does it fit perfectly in Colorado. In case you didn't catch the reference, fresh snow is often called powder snow, and you have to have a good night's sleep to enjoy that. In a galaxy far, far away, just kidding, in our very own galaxy, Volkswagen invented one of the most beloved cars of all time. The Beetle. And who knew this version looks exactly like Darth Vader? Poor Luke, though. He'll have to keep seeing his father's face everywhere. So, do you know any other genius designs we haven't shown here? Do tell! Have you ever wondered how cool buildings of the future are going to look? Well, hold on tight because artificial intelligence is here to revolutionize the world of architecture. AI is a great sidekick. It can give the architects incredible new tools to create mind-blowing structures that are not only stunning, but also eco-friendly and super efficient. So let's check what our beautiful future might look like. First of all, you know how cities can get crazy busy and overwhelming, right? Well, guess what? AI is here to save the day and make our cities super smart. Imagine you're cruising down the road in your flying car. Yes, we'll have those. Thanks to AI, the traffic flows like a dream. No more endless gridlock. The city knows where the most likely crime spots are and takes proactive steps to keep us safe. It's like having superheroes on every corner. And hey, forget about trash piling up. AI makes sure waste is managed efficiently, keeping our city clean and fresh. They can act as a city manager who can optimize everything from traffic to safety and even waste disposal. They can analyze tons of data from all sorts of places like sensors and social media. With all that information, they can help city planners make brilliant decisions that make our lives better. Okay, so you stroll down the street, and your eyes are instantly captivated by an extraordinary building. Its futuristic curves and features make it stand out from the rest. And it not only catches your eye, but also gives Mother Nature a high five. You might think it was designed by a genius architect, but little do you know it was actually a collaboration between humans and artificial intelligence. Imagine having a super smart design buddy who can whip up thousands of incredible building ideas in a blink of an eye. That's what AI-assisted design software does for architects. It can generate and assess a ton of design options. They take into account stuff like the best materials to use and the perfect placement for the building. Also, by analyzing data and crunching numbers, algorithms can help optimize the building's design. 
they can ensure it minimizes energy usage, conserves water, and manages waste like a pro. Every building strives to reduce costs, save energy, and promote a better world. The result? Architectural masterpieces that are both jaw-droppingly beautiful and super practical. The cityscape of the future will be dotted with these awe-inspiring structures. Oh, but that wasn't impressive enough for you? Well, how about a stunning, futuristic building that seems to defy gravity? It's not made of traditional bricks and mortar, oh no! This marvel was created using the powers of 3D printing. With the help of AI, architects designed every intricate detail and fed all the important data, like what materials to use and how the site conditions might affect the structure. AI algorithms worked their magic to optimize the design, making it both breathtakingly beautiful and rock solid. 3D printing is basically like having a magical machine that can create awesome structures straight out of a sci-fi movie, and AI jumps in to make sure these structures are not just pretty, but also strong. In the city of the future, 3D printing will become the ultimate architect's tool. It will allow them to create structures that were once impossible to build. From mind-bending shapes to intricate details, the possibilities are endless. But AI isn't just making buildings look great, it also makes them efficient and cozy. Let's say you step into a futuristic office building, and voila! The lights automatically adjust to match your mood, and the temperature is set perfectly for you. These futuristic buildings are capable of sensing and responding to their surroundings, just like you do. They control the lighting, keeping it just right for the time of day. They manage the temperature, so it's always cozy and comfortable. They even keep a watchful eye on security and fix small issues before they become big headaches. So, the smart building knows when people come and go, so it optimizes energy usage accordingly, saving the planet and some cash along the way. Now the cool thing is, all these aren't the only possibilities. How about turning skyscrapers into a vertical forest? Recently, an architect from India got super excited about the power of artificial intelligence. So, he decided to team up with an image bot called Midjourney to create a vision for the future. But instead of a dull, robotic world, they aimed for something spectacular. With text prompts like utopian technology and futuristic towers, the architect and AI got to work. Guess what? Midjourney didn't disappoint. It conjured up a world where buildings were covered in lush vertical forests and adorned with shapes inspired by nature. They wanted to create a sustainable future that harmonized with the environment. The architect, Manas Bhatia, is super positive about AI's potential. He doesn't see it as a threat to his job, but as a powerful tool for positive change. He envisions a future where architects and AI collaborate to make breathtaking designs. In his project, Patia even asked the AI to imagine symbiotic and hollowed structures, and it responded with pictures of apartments nestled within hollowed-out trees. Imagine a world where the building itself becomes a living, breathing part of nature. Well, Bhatia believes that nature should play a big role in architecture. He loves designing structures that embrace nature's beauty and functionality. From buildings built around trees to facades that regulate temperature, he's all about blending architecture with the natural world. With architects like Patia and the superpowers of AI, the future of cities is going to be amazing. So get ready to step into a world where nature and technology coexist in perfect harmony. It's a dream we can't wait to see come true. Or if you're not a big fan of trees, how about this? Skyscrapers that aren't made of solid bricks, but instead, they're inflatable wonders. Zumo, an architectural practice in Barcelona, used the magic of AI to bring these wobbly structures to life. These inflatable superstructures rise above future cities like illuminated balloons in the sky. Here's the best part. These inflatable buildings have sustainability superpowers. You can pump them up to towering heights, flatten them for easy transportation, and rebuild them wherever they're needed. Plus, they're powered by renewable energy, reducing their impact on the environment. Pretty cool, right? Phew, the future is zooming toward us like a rocket. Artificial intelligence can become the secret sauce that makes architects work extra special. But hey, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to use AI wisely and ethically. For now, we don't have to worry about machines replacing architects. Artificial intelligence still needs a human hand, or else we might end up with buildings that look like mashed up bananas or ice cream cones, unless that's your thing. In addition, humans have one important advantage. 
they, well, are humans. We need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence doesn't have emotional intelligence. It's a brainy genius, but it can't fully understand the feelings and vibes we humans crave in our spaces. So, we must remember to infuse our designs with that human touch, those warm and fuzzy elements that make us go, ah, I feel right at home. And let's not forget that AI is still learning. It's basically just taking its first steps, and we need to be patient and give it time to grow. Rushing things too quickly could lead to wonky designs or buildings that look like a jumbled puzzle. This might look cool if you like avant-garde architecture, but for regular folk, no thanks. So, as the future unfolds at warp speed, let's embrace the wonders of AI and architecture. But let's also remember to balance its brilliance with our own human touch. Together, we can create a future where buildings are not just functional, but also filled with heart and soul. It's an adventure that's out of this world. Hey, I have an invitation for you. Pack your bags and let's head down to the world's most visited city, Paris. The city of love, the city of blinding lights, or whatever you want to call it. Our goal is to uncover as many secrets as possible regarding the world-famous Musée de Louvre. Are you up for it? Grab your travel book and bon voyage. The Louvre makes a big impression if you're visiting it for the first time. The traditional French Renaissance architecture is mixed with some modern elements, like the Louvre Pyramid. And that's our first stop today. To get inside the museum, you can go through the huge glass pyramid sitting right there in the Louvre's courtyard. If you're wondering what's the deal with this pyramid, let's stop here for a few minutes and learn some more about it. The Louvre Pyramid hasn't been here since the beginning. After all, the Louvre's main building, aka the Louvre Palace, dates back to 1190. But before it looked like what you see today, this place was a castle, full of moats and dungeons, and not dragons, because those aren't real, unfortunately. Anyways, the palace was commissioned by French King Philip II. Oh, and you can check out some of the medieval Louvre in the museum's basement. The Louvre only became a museum quite recently, historically speaking. In 1793, after the French Revolution, the nation decided that this building would be used to display France's prized collection of art. It wasn't until the 1980s that the idea of the glass pyramid came along. Then President Francois Mitterrand issued a big renovation of the Louvre. The project was called Grand Louvre, and it included the construction of a new entrance for visitors. By the 80s, the museum had already been receiving millions of visitors per year, and the entrance would often get crowded. And that's when foreign architect Ayo Ming Pei comes along. Mitterrand hired Pei to build an entrance that would connect the museum's three pavilions. And if you ask me, I'd say he did a pretty good job. We're talking about 200 tons of glass and iron. Not to mention that this glass, the so-called diamond glass, was specially designed to be completely transparent, without any green or blue tint to it. Pei wanted visitors to have a clear view of the main buildings without the glass interfering with it. It took two years just to get the glass color right. It also took a while before Pei decided he was going to build a pyramid. He experimented with designing a cube and even a hemisphere. But since the original building doesn't have any curves, this would make the courtyard piece too out of context. So, he decided to build a pyramid instead, inspired by the ones in Egypt. After all, the Louvre holds an immense collection of ancient Egyptian artifacts. So that kind of makes sense. Just a wild guess here. The thing is, the French are pretty critical. And once the Louvre pyramid was finished in 1988, it became the center of a very heated debate. Public opinion was unsettled by such a modern construction. Today, people take all kinds of weird selfies with the pyramid. But back then, locals were saying that the modern architecture had nothing to do with the Louvre's Renaissance style or even the history of the building. Some even said that the pyramid wasn't French enough. Yikes! <laughs> Standing in line to get inside the Louvre, you can't help but wonder, how do people clean this huge glass pyramid? We're talking glass slopes, so this sure isn't an easy feat. In the beginning, the museum administration apparently hired mountaineers to climb it and clean it. 
and some still do this job nowadays when the robot built for this task can't clean all the dirty spots off the glass. I'm not joking, the Louvre Pyramid is cleaned by a robot. You know what they say, the future is here. Once you're down the escalators, you'll notice that this awesome pyramid you were taking pictures with upstairs has an inverted face to it downstairs. It serves as a skylight to the Carousel de Louvre, which is like an underground shopping mall or the museum's main lobby. Hey, look, there's an Apple store, except that the French people pronounce it iPad. You'll have the option to choose from three different wings of the museum, the Richelieu, Soli, or Denon. I say we begin with Denon. You'll understand why in a bit. Did you know that the Louvre exhibits around 35,000 pieces of art? That's why it's virtually impossible to visit everything in one day. If you're an art lover, you'll have to come back here for more visits. But to see all the pieces of art spending around 30 seconds on each, you'd have to visit the Louvre over 100 times. And that's not counting restroom and lunch breaks. You get the picture, right? The museum is huge. That's why it takes about a 10-minute walk to get from the lobby entrance to the Louvre's most famous painting, the Mona Lisa. But since you're here early, you managed to take good pictures of this Da Vinci masterpiece. A little known fact, the Mona Lisa was once stolen from the Louvre. It was once stolen at night by a man called Vincenzo Perugia. He was an employee of the museum, and investigators think he slept inside the Louvre to perform what is known as the greatest art theft of the 20th century. Apparently, the next morning, Vincenzo simply walked out of the museum with the Mona Lisa hidden among his belongings. The Mona Lisa was gone for almost two years until the painting was recovered in Italy. Who knows, maybe she enjoyed the trip back to her homeland. If you're an art history buff, you might know that the Mona Lisa has lots of theories revolving around it. The painting is shrouded in mystery, that's a fact. A strong case has been made that the Mona Lisa could be a self-portrait of da Vinci himself. Historians have compared da Vinci's face and that of the Mona Lisa, and guess what? They appear to be strikingly similar. Also, a 2010 study done by Italy's Committee for Cultural Heritage found that there is a collection of symbols hidden in the painting. These are only visible through highly technological magnifying lenses, but they showed that Leonardo inscribed an LV inside Mona Lisa's right eye. Experts guess that this is da Vinci's signature, but the other symbols, a CE in the left eye and a 72 in the arch of the background bridge are still a mystery. But enough about La Gioconda, we want to get to the Soli wing of the museum. Along the way, you'll see some people sitting in front of paintings with a drawing book or even a canvas. Is that allowed? Yep, this is a very interesting feature of the Musée de Louvre. The museum houses an art school called École de Louvre. The students of this school, as well as other Parisian institutions, can get permits to sit in front of paintings and copy them. This way, promising young artists can learn directly from the source. They copy the works of Renoir, Monet, and Poussin, trying to figure out the techniques these painters used. Hmm, can I sign up for this, please? To finish your tour, you're visiting the ancient moat we talked about earlier in this video. You know, the one that was part of the original Louvre when it was still a castle. Thanks to the archaeological excavations that happened in the 1980s, this part was uncovered and has been open for visitation since 2016. You can even see a miniature model of what the original castle looked like. And if you visited other landmarks in Paris, you'll notice that it's pretty similar to the Conciergerie. I wonder if they've ever thought about producing cheese down here. It seems like a perfect place. Oh well, I hope you enjoyed learning some secrets of the world's most famous museum. See you next time! After winning the lottery, Gerald got very rich. He bought a huge villa and hired an art dealer to invest in some masterpieces. The art dealer convinced Gerald to buy a very expensive antique statue for his collection. One day, Gerald's daughter came to visit him. He boasted about the statue, but his daughter began to laugh. She said that scammers had deceived Gerald. Why did she say so? There's a small engraving on the statue. It says, Made in China. 
Wendy is the president of the local reading club. Its members usually gather in her home because it's large and beautiful. But one evening, someone hit Wendy on the head in her library after the club meeting was over. The girl didn't see who it was. The next day, police officers questioned three suspects. Melanie said that she had left the meeting earlier that night. She had a night flight to Paris. Kelly said that she had been the last person to leave Wendy's house, but she hadn't noticed anything suspicious. Amy was absent that day because it was her husband's birthday. Who is lying? Melanie, if she had a flight to Paris, why isn't she there? Take a look at this picturesque field. Can you see anything weird? This sunflower over here. Josh worked as a security guard at a large international airport. One day, he received a call from the cleaning staff. They found someone's dog. Josh had to figure out who was the dog's owner. Take a look at these passengers. Can you identify the dog's owner among them? This guy over here has a bone in his bag. And there's dog hair on his pants. He must be the owner. Take a look at this pattern. Can you spot the odd emoji? This parrot over here has different wings. Jason has recently been hired as an art gallery assistant. He got a large delivery one morning. Five rare paintings from the Middle Ages. Jason called his boss immediately and told her that two of the five paintings are fake. How has he figured it out? There's a skyscraper in the background of this painting. And this picture seems to be authentic, but look at the sky. There's an aircraft flying among birds. Take a look at this picture. Can you find the odd emoji? These guys over here. After a long road trip, Lily finally arrived at her friend's wedding venue in another city. The food looked very appetizing and Lily was starving. So she headed for the table, but suddenly the lights went off and Lily fainted. She woke up the next day with a terrible headache. Just like all the other guests, none of them remembered anything about how the party ended. Look at these two pictures. They were taken before and after the lights went out. Can you guess what happened at the party? The balloons popped. Someone had filled them with sleeping gas. This person wanted everyone to fall asleep. It might have been done to help the bride run away because she's absent this morning. Jill is an art teacher. One morning, she entered her art studio and got very surprised. The entire wall and the students' drawings were stained with paint. Jill interviewed three suspects. The cleaning lady hadn't cleaned the class the day before because she'd had a day off. Jill's student, Rosie, said that she had left the studio at 6 p.m. At that time, everything was okay. Another student, Rick, confessed that he had brought his girlfriend to the studio to show off his paintings. But they left at 8 p.m. Who is responsible for this mess? The cat! It got into the studio through an open window. Take a look at this picture. Why did he tie his friend down? It's a full moon. His friend began turning into a werewolf and the guy got scared. Two guys are trying to get Hillary's attention by showing off their money. The first man sends her a selfie of him near a private jet, and the second sends a photo of him wearing a pilot's uniform and flying a jumbo jet. Whose salary is higher? Pilots earn good money, so the second guy is definitely well off, and the first guy probably just works at the airport. Four artists gathered in a park to paint landscapes. Having finished his first drawing, Bill went to the bathroom. When Bill returned, 
he found out that his drawing was ruined. He was very upset and questioned his friends. Stephen didn't see what happened. He was away buying coffee for everyone. Dylan didn't look at the paintings. He was distracted by a conversation with a beautiful woman. Kelly said that she'd been painting her own portrait in another part of the park. Who's lying? Kelly, if she had been painting, why is her canvas blank? Stephen had a rough day at college, so he decided to relax and went to his favorite restaurant with other students. Sam, Jill, and Jules each ordered a cappuccino. Rebecca, Peter, and Helen each ordered an espresso. What drink did Stephen order? Cappuccino or espresso? Espresso. Stephen has two letter E's in his name, just like Rebecca, Peter, and Helen. Can you spot anything weird in this picture? This coconut doesn't look as fresh as the others. Henry was walking along the street. Suddenly, a witch appeared in front of him. She opened a portal, grabbed Henry, and took him to her castle. Henry asked her to let him go, but the witch said, Now you will serve me forever. Henry had a notebook and a pen in his pocket. He offered the witch a deal. If I write your weight in this notebook, will you let me go? The witch was very intrigued and agreed. Henry wrote something down, and she had to let him go. What did he write? As promised, Henry wrote, your weight. Can you guess the food by these emojis? It's sushi. How about this one? Hot chocolate. Let's take it up a notch. Can you guess the dish by these emojis? It's pizza. How about this? It's a cheeseburger. Can you guess the food by these emojis? It's fruit ice. How about this combination? Any ideas? That's right, it's french fries. The next product. You probably like it hot. A peanut butter cookie. How about this combination? That's right, it's a salad. Jack bought his girlfriend an expensive dress for her birthday. He left the dress in his wardrobe and left the house. When he returned, he saw that the dress was gone. Only three people were at home that day, and he questioned them. Jack's sister, Laura, said that she'd been cleaning the house since morning. Jack's mother, Rose, had been planting flowers in the garden. And Jack's aunt, Nina, had been cooking a birthday dinner all day long. Who stole the dress? It was Jack's mother. There are no flowers in the garden. Take a look at this picture. Can you find the odd emoji? This guy over here. One day, Mr. Blue, Mr. Red, and Mr. White met for dinner. When they took off their jackets, Mr. Blue drew everyone's attention to the fact that each of them was wearing a shirt whose color was different from their last name. The man in the white shirt looked surprised and said, Yeah, Mr. Blue, you're right. Can you figure out what color each man was wearing? Mr. Blue can be wearing only a white or red shirt, but we know for sure that a different man is wearing a white shirt. 
This means that Mr. Blue must be wearing a red shirt. Mr. White could be wearing a blue or a red shirt. But the red shirt is already taken by Mr. Blue. Therefore, Mr. White is wearing a blue shirt. That means Mr. Red is wearing a white shirt. How about this picture? Do you see any odd emojis here? This one over there. Jessica was a famous art dealer. Many painters were dreaming of working with her. One day, she entered an art class and noticed a stunning landscape. Wow, who painted this masterpiece? She asked. Three artists came up to her. Each claimed he was the author of the painting. Can you help Jessica identify the real author? It's the guy over here. His palette contains exactly the colors that we see in the painting. Take a look at this picture. Can you spot what's wrong here? Dolphins don't swim in forest lakes. Once, a strict king ruled his kingdom. The magical town where he lived was surrounded by high walls. No one was allowed to leave the town, and anyone who wanted to enter the town had to have special documents. If they didn't, they were sent away. The Magic Kingdom was connected with the rest of the world with a wooden bridge. It was under the watch of the king's wizard, who drove away all uninvited guests with his magic. He would walk out to check the bridge every five minutes, and he would then stay inside for another five minutes. To cross the bridge, a person needed nine minutes, and still, one citizen managed to escape the town. How did he do it? The man was walking across the bridge for about five minutes while the wizard was inside. After that, he turned back and started walking toward the town. When he reached the wall, the wizard asked for his documents. The man didn't have any, so he was sent away. Maggie is an art critic. One day, she decided to visit a fancy restaurant famous for its unique art collection. Maggie took a seat and began to study the paintings hanging on the walls. When the waitress approached her table, Maggie asked how old those paintings were. The waitress said that they only had 18th century art pieces in the restaurant. Maggie left that place immediately and wrote an angry review on their website. Liars! Why? Look at this portrait. Do you recognize this face? It's the waitress. It's very unlikely that she's more than 300 years old, unless she's a vampire. Imagine you can spend an entire week digging in the ground, scanning for ruins, and taking photographs of the world's most surreal archaeological sites. Would you be up for it? Grab your magnifying glasses, and let's do some digging. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Walk around the city stumbling upon ancient history, I mean. So, you're strolling around Esquiline Hill on a sunny afternoon. You have just finished your third gelato when you suddenly see it. The magnificent Dalmas Aurea, or Golden House, for the non-Latin speakers. The Roman Emperor Nero ordered to build this huge palace back in 64 BCE. The construction finished in 68 BCE. In its glory days, it occupied an area three times the size of the Vatican City. The building had gold leaf decor, semi-precious stones, and tons, tons of frescoes. There were over 300 rooms in the palace, some of them overlooking the beautiful vineyard and animal-filled woods nearby. It held an enormous 100-foot statue of Nero himself. The octagonal wall was the grandest construction in the complex. Originally, it was a banquet hall with waterfalls cascading down the back walls. The hall rotated around its axis day and night as petals fell from above. Nero's successors stripped the whole palace of its materials. Today, tourists can visit the main structure and, of course, the octagonal hall. They excavated it and you'll easily recognize it even with its bare walls. After flying halfway across the world, we're deep in the Cambodian jungle. Good thing you brought bug spray with you. 
mosquitoes can get crazy in this tropical climate. Hidden among the forest is the city of Angkor. It was the capital of the Khmer Empire from the 9th to 15th century. FYI, the word Angkor means capital city in the Khmer language. The city became one of the largest in the pre-industrial world. Researchers say nearly 1 million people used to live there. Today, Angkor attracts visitors from around the world because of its stunning architecture. You can recognize the Khmer style in the use of huge blocks of sandstone. At the center of the complex lies Bayon Temple. It's decorated with 216 smiling faces, which scientists say are meant to resemble the founder of the Angkor Empire. They believe the towers used to be decorated with gold, but today the site is a maze of vine-covered temples. The city was abandoned in 1431 and wasn't rediscovered until the 1840s. In 1992, they named it a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The United States is not usually synonymous with ruins, but here's one. In the mountainous state of Colorado lies the ancient home place of ancestral Pueblons. Throughout the Mesa Verde National Park, there are over 600 cliff dwellings built by the Pueblons around the 1190s. The Cliff Palace alone had over 150 rooms. It was a multi-story building of sandstone and mud mortar. To arrive at the Balcony House, visitors had to climb a 32-foot ladder. There, you can see a mid-sized village of 38 rooms and two kivas. Kivas are traditional chambers built by Pueblons for ceremonial purposes. By 1300, the Pueblon occupation of the Mesa Verde ended. Thankfully, the site is open for visits now. If you like terracotta landscapes, you came to the right place. The city of Petra is a marvel of the ancient world. Located in Jordan's desert, the city was a commercial hub back in the 4th century BCE. The Nabataeans, an Arab Bedouin tribe, lived in the so-called Rose City and thrived for many years, accumulating a significant amount of wealth they invented an innovative water management system that made the region habitable. The rock-carved gate-light structure Petra is famous for is what is called the Pharaoh's Treasury. It stands at the main entrance to the site and is said to have a hidden treasure beneath it. In the early 2000s, the site was named one of the seven new wonders of the world. All the way in South America, in the country of Guatemala, lie ancient Mayan ruins. The lost city of Tikal is a site made of 12,000 buildings, the remains of the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. It is comparable in importance to London or New York. The North Acropolis is Tikal's most ancient complex of monuments. Built solely by human hands in 750 BCE, it served as the resting place of kings and chiefs. Back in the day, the Steppe Pyramid temples were painted a beautiful red. Mayans loved that color. Today, of course, you'll only see the limestone. Archaeologists have no clue as to the cause of Tikal's decline. Was it drought, disease, or something else altogether? Located on the left bank of the River Tigris is a strange old ruin, a battered archway. It belonged to a city named Tesiphon, the jewel of the Persian Empire for over 800 years. The city hosted an extravagant palace, decorated with a glass mosaic, jewel-adorned carpets, and a lot of marble. What is it with royalty and marble anyway? The arch was part of an imperial palace complex. Until modern times, it was the largest man-made freestanding vault. Notice how there are no pillars sustaining it. The enormous wealth of the city made it a constant target for other empires, until it eventually fell. In the mood for some more Mayan ruins? Chichen Itza is an archaeological site with the best preserved pyramids on Earth. Located in Mexico's Yucatan state, this Mayan city is well over 1,500 years old. At its peak, it was home to 35,000 people. The site has a total of 26 ruins to be uncovered. The highlight here is El Castillo, a tremendous step-like temple standing 80 feet above the ground. Its most peculiar feature is that it has 91 steps up each of its four sides, including the upper platform. It makes for 365 steps, the number of days in the solar year. 
The oldest lost city in this list dates back to the Neolithic period. It was when us, human beings, started farming for the first time, instead of living a fully nomadic lifestyle based on hunting and gathering. Located on Orkney Island off the coast of Scotland is a prehistoric site known as Scara Bray. Thanks to good restoration, the site is very well preserved. You can see prehistoric dwellings with hearths, stone-built furniture, and even primitive toilets. Researchers found runic symbols on the site, which means they could have attempted some form of writing. Ah, Greece. Fancy some feta cheese, anyone? We've arrived at the focal point of archaeological sites, but today we're exploring one in particular, the Colossus of Rhodes also known as the Bronze Giant. It used to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, standing in the harbor of the Greek city of Rhodes back in the 3rd century BCE. The Colossus was said to be 105 feet tall. It's believed that the statue was built with the help of 900 camels. Sadly, it only stood for 54 years. A ravaging earthquake tore it to pieces, so visitors would come and see only a giant foot. Now, there is a whole load of nothing where the statue once stood. I think it's safe to say there are a lot of random ruins on walls spread across the globe. And our final visit for the day consists of exactly those. All the way in northern England lies the ruin of Hadrian's Wall. The Roman Emperor commissioned the wall in order to separate his empire from Britain's. The original wall was a lot grander than what is left of it today. But still, the ruins are pretty impressive. They consist of a 73-mile structure stretching from one coast to the other. Back in the day, Hadrian's Wall hosted 17 large forts and numerous observation towers to ensure the maximum safety of his empire. The wall fell into oblivion when the Romans left Britain at the start of the 5th century. People began looting it to build churches, farms, and even houses. Today, if you decide to visit the ruins, you'll only see waist-high fragments of stone. But still, pretty neat, huh? Let's play a little guessing game. I'm going to name the sites you have on your bucket list. Machu Picchu, the Colosseum, Petra, Taj Mahal. Did I get at least one of them right? I have to confess, I was just taking them off the list of the new seven wonders of the world. It was officially finished in 2007 after a worldwide vote. What happened to the old list? Well, it was put together in the 2nd century BCE. And there is just one site currently still standing, the Pyramids of Giza. Pack your bags. We're going to Peru, the home of the mighty Machu Picchu. When it was first discovered in 1911, its explorer thought he had managed to find the lost city of the Inca. Several decades later, it turned out it wasn't the same city. Plus, there were still three farmer families living there, so it couldn't be really called lost and forgotten. No wonder they like it so much there. The stones making up the buildings are cut so precisely and sit together so tightly that you can't even insert a credit card between them. It has saved the city from some serious earthquakes, which are common here. The buildings just dance through all the shaking and then go back into place. And because of the way it's arranged, you can see the sun rise or set exactly behind the important peaks on important days for the Inca. More than half, 60% of all the construction in Machu Picchu was done underground, so you can't even see it. The best part is that there are still things to be discovered if you want to get your name inked in history. Our next stop is on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. The mighty Chichen Itza sits here for well over 1,500 years. The structure has exactly 365 steps. You can count when you go next time if you don't trust me. The Maya, who built the whole thing, were really into astronomy. So it's not surprising they made as many steps as there are days in a year. Also, if you happen to be here during the spring or fall equinox, you'll notice the shadows the setting sun casts make it look like there's a snake going down the stairs. The feathered serpent was one of the main deities in ancient Mexico. Chichen Itza used to be a busy urban center. It had its ups and downs. And by the time the Spanish arrived the 16th century, it had been mostly abandoned. The first photos we have from the spot are from the end of the 19th century. 
Looks like the terraced pyramid had a lot more vegetation on it back in 1892. The only source of fresh water in this dry climate is the cenotes, or water-filled sinkholes. There are four visible cenotes, and the temple pyramid most likely stands on top of one more. Archaeologists are looking for tunnels to enter it. To see our next wonder, you must be prepared to share it with around 15,000 others. That's how many people visit the statue of Christ the Redeemer every day. The statue sits above the Corcovado mountain and weighs roughly 635 tons. Must have been tricky to lift it all the way up there. Actually, it came in parts. A French sculptor, Paul Landowski, made several pieces of the future sculpture out of clay. The head and the hands were made in full size and the body would be made larger on the spot. The parts of the statue were cut into cubes and then cast into concrete and put together. Workers prepared the cement right on the spot and transferred all the tools by a small cogwheel railroad which tourists used to get up the hill. The statue is the best proof that lightning does strike in the same place more than once. It must be because of its position on top of the mountain, its fingers, head and eyebrows got damaged by storms. Time to move on. This time, we're going to Agra, India. Yep, to see the Taj Mahal, that beautiful pink construction. Wait, wasn't it always white? Well, the Taj Mahal changes its color depending on what time it is. It looks pale pink or pearly gray at sunrise, crystal white at noon, and the sunset paints it orange bronze. In the evening, it may even seem translucent blue. And that's not the only optical illusion here. When you move towards the main gate, the building seems gigantic. But the closer you get to it, the smaller it looks. The minarets, or towers, on both sides might seem to be standing perfectly straight, but in reality, they're leaning outward. It's done for aesthetic balance, and also to prevent the towers from falling on the main building in case of an earthquake. For construction finished in the 17th century, the Taj Mahal looks good as new. That's because it regularly gets a spa day. They apply a proper facial mud pack to it, which is a traditional recipe to keep the radiance. I'm feeling peckish from all the traveling. How about we go to Italy and have some pasta? Just kidding. The real reason would be to see the Colosseum, of course. Its original name was the Flavian Amphitheater because it was built by the Flavian Dynasty. The new name is most likely after the colossal bronze statue of Emperor Nero that was once next to the building. The model for the statue was the Colossus of Rhodes. In its nearly 2,000 years, the Colosseum has lived through at least three major fires and four earthquakes. It was damaged, repaired, and rebuilt many times. The impressive construction once hosted up to 80,000 spectators. What they watched wasn't necessarily as cruel as Hollywood made us believe. Most gladiator matches went under strict rules. <sighs> Sometimes the public would get bored with the show, and the participants would draw out of the arena. Once the Colosseum stopped serving as an arena for those scary shows, it was used as a cemetery, a place of worship, for housing, workshops for artisans and merchants, the home of a religious order, and a fortified castle. Now it's open to the public, and you can check out its underground labyrinth. Are you ready for the next wonder? It's the lost city of Petra, or rather, the rediscovered city, which was once super rich and vibrant, then got abandoned and found again in 1812. The whole city is made of sandstone, and even though it's in the desert, it has seen some pretty heavy rains. Still, it has lasted 2,000 years thanks to some very skilled workers. Modern laser scanning showed that they put giant steps into the mountain to check the quality of the rock and carve out the buildings without risking their lives. And how did people survive here in the desert without any water? The Nabataeans who lived here developed a whole complicated system of conduits, dams and cisterns to make sure they have enough vital fluid for the whole year. In case you're in your Indiana Jones mode, there's still a lot to discover here in Petra. Archaeologists believe we only know 15% of the city by now, and the rest is still hidden underground. Let's finish our tour with the largest human-made project in the world. Yep, I'm talking about the Great Wall of China. 
It stretches for over 13,000 miles from the Bohai Sea in the east all the way to the Gobi Desert in the west. But don't trust the popular myth. You won't really see the wall from the moon. It took over 2,000 years to finish and a good amount of building materials, mostly bricks and cut stone blocks. Have you ever scratched your name on a tree or even worse, some famous place? No worries, I won't tell anyone. People who built the wall did the same. Some of the bricks, which are mostly from the Ming Dynasty, have some data like production location, brick household name, and the responsible officials. This was a form of quality control. If something happened to any of the bricks, it would be easy to find out who to blame for it. Have you ever seen a skyscraper that can change its shape? The creators of the FNF Tower in Panama City had a concept and only $50 million, which isn't a lot in skyscraper money. So they couldn't afford a mistake, and they finished a concrete structure with the 39 upper floors rotating 9 degrees around an axis from the first attempt without spending any extra time or materials. Dubai's rotating tower will look different every time you see it, once it's finished. Each of its 80 floors will rotate 360 degrees individually around the center of the building. The lucky residents will be able to control that rotation, which means they can choose their view from the window. A complete lap should take about 90 minutes. And no, the tower won't be a huge waste of electricity. It will produce its own energy. Wind turbines between the floors will drive the rotations. If you've ever wanted to live inside a video game, book an apartment in the King Power Mahana Khan building. This pixelated skyscraper around the height of the Eiffel Tower is the tallest building in Thailand. The secret behind its looks is the horizontally and vertically divided glass windows. It took five years to finish this beauty with over 200 apartments, a hotel, luxury shops, restaurants, and one of the most breathtaking viewpoints in the world. The Libyan International Building features one of the world's tallest artificial waterfalls running right down its side. No worries, they only turn it on on special occasions, and it uses a mix of recycled tap water and rainwater. When it started running for the first time, the non-informed locals even reported a huge water leak. The Cyber Texture Office Building in Mumbai looks like a huge egg made of glass and steel. It was actually inspired by a vessel that, like our planet, has its own ecosystem. To bring down the heat levels inside, the architects chose the ideal orientation and added sun shading and an underground cooling system. The Marina Bay Sands in Singapore seems like a Stonehenge look-alike, but its architect claims that he was inspired by a house of cards. The horizontal one is balanced on the three vertical ones. They are three 55-story hotels with restaurants, nightclubs, gardens, shops, museums, and movie theaters. The horizontal card is an infinity swimming pool with the best view of the city for up to 4,000 visitors. The pool hangs at the height of the 57th floor, and it feels like nothing is holding it. The dancing house definitely stands out among the more traditional architecture in Prague. The nickname for the house is Fred and Ginger. The stone tower symbolizes the famous dancer Fred Astaire, and the glass tower, his partner, Ginger Rogers. There's even imaginary hair on top of Fred's tower. 99 concrete panels support the dancing shape, all of them of different dimensions. Umeda Sky Building, twice the height of Big Ben, consists of two towers of glass and steel to the north of Osaka Station. The floating garden observatory connects the towers on top. Although the building is in a huge city, the skywalk is so high in the clouds that the only thing you'll hear up there is the wind. If you're scared of heights, you can visit an urban garden, a theater, an art museum, or one of the many offices closer to the ground inside the building. Architect Octavio Mendoza owns probably the largest piece of pottery in the world. If you're ever in Colombia, ask the locals for directions to the Flintstone House. Yes, they call it that for a reason. The official name is Casa Terracotta, and the architect only used clay to build it. He let it bake and harden in the sun, which transformed the pliable material into solid ceramic. 
Every curve of the building is designed after the surrounding hills. All the furniture inside is also made of clay. Mendoza is determined to work on the casa for the rest of his life. Artists Dennis Sullivan and Francis Conklin have been saving money for 15 years, carving smaller wooden dogs to create their dream project. The Dog Bark Park Inn in Cottonwood is a 12-foot beagle that stands proud in the Idaho prairie. There is a bedroom and a living area in its body and an extra bedroom in the head. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be inside a huge carpet? Eh, me neither. But checking out the Azerbaijan National Carpet Museum is definitely worth it anyway. It shows the history of this important local craft in every detail. Austrian architect Franz Jans designed the construction, and it took six years to finish it. The basket building in Ohio looks exactly like a real shopping basket, except it's 160 times larger. It even has two attached handles. The building served as the headquarters of Longaberger Basket Company, then was sold to become a luxury hotel. A giant whale? An airship? Can you guess what's inside this building in Graz, Austria? Two British architects won the Europe-wide competition to design this art museum. The biomorphic construction has around 1,000 acrylic glass elements on its skin. During the night, it can send light signals and messages to people on the other side of the river. It takes in daylight from the north through nozzles on its top. The needle is a viewing platform. The Half House in Toronto, Canada was built in the late 19th century and was one of six identical houses standing next to each other. When developers came to this area, the owners of all the other houses agreed to move. And this one wouldn't go. A demolition crew showed some impressive skills as they managed to tear down the neighboring house without doing any damage at all to what is now the half house. The white exterior wall used to be load-bearing, dividing the neighbors' bedrooms and living rooms. One wrong move of the excavator and the entire construction would become ruins. The shell house in Isla Mujeres, Mexico, stands by the ocean, was inspired by the ocean, and looks like one of the ocean's symbols. The house is shell-shaped and covered with shells from nearby beaches. Architect Eduardo Ocampo designed this beauty as he wanted to have a one-of-a-kind house for his brother to come and visit more often. Now it's up for rent for vacationers. The Bubble Palace, not far away from Cannes in France, was designed by a Hungarian architect and purchased by Pierre Cardin. In case you have a couple of spare million, you can buy this interesting property. You'll get 10 bedroom suites decorated by contemporary artists, gardens, water ponds, a swimming pool, and a 500 seat outdoor auditorium with an awesome view of the Bay of Cannes as a bonus. Can you find one house standing straight here? I know, I also failed. All the cubes in the cube house in Rotterdam are tilted 45 degrees at their side. The idea here was to make the most of the space. Dutch architect Piet Blom designed the houses in the late 70s to look like an abstract forest. Each triangular roof represents a treetop. The houses stand at three floors tall with an entrance on the ground floor, an open kitchen, and a living room on the first floor, as well as a bathroom with two bedrooms on the top floor. The Boot in Tasman, New Zealand is a hotel that looks like it comes straight out of a children's book. It even has legit shoelaces. There's a spiral staircase, cozy fireplace, kitchenette, and a bedroom with a balcony. If you ever find yourself in Mitchell, South Dakota, be sure not to miss out on their key tourist attraction, the Corn Palace. The locals have always been so proud of prairie gold that they first built a palace out of corn back in 1892 to prove to the rest of the world how fertile their lands are. What you can see now is the rebuilt version. Every year, they put new corn in 13 shades to form new beautiful